Hey, we want to start. We got a new song tonight. I think you're going to enjoy it. I'm going to sing it, but if you want to stand, we're just going to sing the chorus. We'll sing it twice so you get a chance to get it right, you know, since you don't know it. <laughs> All right, this is how it goes. I take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start. Take you at your word. Pretty easy, right? Let's sing it again. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I'll take
Each one of us here, each one of us watching online, we have some things, some stuff, some situations, circumstances that the enemy loves to lob, to try to leverage into our life. And would you, just as a song that we declared, would you turn it? Would you spin it? Would you take it, remove it, turn it upside down? That would be for our good and that you would bring good out of it. I pray that for my friends tonight. Would you minister 
to their hearts, to our hearts here as we worship you, as we look into your word. We pray for your activity to be loosed in a fresh and in a refreshing kind of way. We ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated here. Kids, we'll see you later. We love you. Um, Lyle is going to come in just a, a moment to, to continue on in our series in Romans chapter 8. But um, this summer, we're kind of experimenting with changing things up a little bit in placement. And uh, just want to say welcome. Uh, I'm Jack, uh, lead pastor here, if we haven't met yet. Uh, and if you are new, uh, we, thanks for taking a chance on us and, and for putting some courage out to come to a new place. We know it takes courage to do that. And so uh, we just we want to welcome you here. Uh, for the next few minutes, we're going to look into God's word as we do every week. And then um, we're going to come back next week and do it again. And then like next week, we'll do it after that. And so like that's kind of what we do. Uh, and we worship a lot. And, and I, what I love hearing your voices sing... Um, because it's not something, like, I can hear myself sing in my car when I drive around, but it's a joyful noise, let's be honest. Um, but I just love listening to us as a church community sing, or even if you're singing from home, I hear you, I hear you. Um, and uh, if you're new, we'd love to, to connect you around here. We do that in a couple different ways. You can download our free church app. Just go to your app store, Element City Church. Find us information there, and then you can fill out a connection card digitally, or you can text the word hello to our text number, which is 520-340-6868. Just text the word hello, and you'll get a couple other quick texts. We know it's kind of hard connecting to a new place, so it's our way of following up with you for about three or four weeks and just trying to walk you through the process. And we'd love to invite you to the 10-minute party, which happens right at the end of service. Lyle would be back there and some of our team. Uh, We'd love to meet you there if you're new. So if you're not new, don't go there. Um, You don't get the popcorn, okay? It's only for new people. Uh, So we have the best kettle corn this side of the Grand Canyon just for you. Uh, If you're new, we'd love to meet you back there. So uh, reminder, uh, this is graduation season. How many of you have been to graduations? How many of you have seen the pictures of graduations? Uh, We don't have any high school graduations right now, but where's Laura? Laura, there you are. Laura graduated law school. So, Laura, congratulations. That's awesome. Well done. I know that was a, a <clears throat> that was a, not just a challenge for law school, but for you and Tommy, like I did your wedding. And you guys lived in two different states for a while, going back and forth for two years. And so well done navigating that. And we just want to celebrate you tonight. And that and any other graduate, if I'm missing you, sorry, uh, shout out to you. Well done. Um, And so, hey, next week we are doing our potluck fundraiser, uh, which means it's a potluck, which means... We need you to bring some food. Um, So you can sign up tonight, and here's my encouragement to you. We have like five of you who have signed up. I know we're two Sonans. We signed up last minute. We're late. We're late to everything. Uh, So I want to encourage you to sign up um, in the app. You can click the link to this uh, genius sign up thing, and you can sign up for main dish for a side or for a dessert auction, and then show up, eat up, and bid up. Okay? Because what we're going to do is we're sending five students and a couple staff to camp this year, uh, along with the manuals team, and we're sending. It'll be like 400 students in California at Cal Baptist University. And so we want to help try to lower the cost of that for them and pay for some of the transportation. So that's what we're bidding for. And that's what it's all going to go to. Uh, And I I know some of you, maybe you started actually giving to this church even last year at this dessert auction. And now you become a partner with us. And so thank you to all of you who partner with the church. Uh, We couldn't do what we do without you. And so uh, we do giving around here in a couple different ways. We have boxes in the back. Most folks give online or through the app, so you can figure that out on your own. So I'd love for you to sign up and be a part of that. And then uh, tonight, as we uh, just move into our teaching time, I want to take a moment to pray for Angela, who sent in a prayer request, uh, and also the Church of the Week. So um, Angela is watching us online. So hi, Angela. I see you. Or I don't see you, but you see me. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to pray for her. She's uh, struggling with some financial needs. And I know as a pastor, uh, she's not alone in that. And that might be some of you. That might be some of you watching online. So I want to take a moment and pray for that. Pray for our church of the week. And then I'll invite Pastor Lyle out here. And uh, you'll see that we are wearing the pastor um, uniform tonight. Okay, so let's pray. Um, Lord, as we just uh, take a moment to, to pray, I pray for my friend Angela. Thanks for connecting her here uh, to Elements. Thanks for allowing her to be part of our family, even digitally and connected online, like a lot of our folks. So, Father, we pray for just that financial strain. 
that I know a lot of people are feeling. In our day and age, in our moment of history, in our time with the inflation where it's at, uh, people struggling. So Father, I'm just asking, um, in your favor, your goodness to us, would you intervene in each story, each life that needs just a, a fresh encouragement from you, that you see them, that you're with them, and that you're working things together, even, even as we're gonna talk about tonight, that you're at work behind the scenes. And so Father, tonight we also pray for our friends at LifePoint Church. Uh, we're choosing them as Church of the Week because they broke ground on new property today, and that's a big, big deal for a church. And so we wanna pray your blessing over Andy and Dan and Micah and the whole team uh, there, Stacy. Uh, they, they mean a lot to us. And we're just asking that you continue to bless their church, uh, to leverage them for your kingdom's sake. God, there's a million plus people in this city that you love that isn't connected into any faith community. And so we need more churches. We need more reach in, within each church, not less. And so we pray that you would be at work in their community as you are here in ours. We pray your blessing over Lyle as we look into your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Uniform, yeah. How embarrassing. We wore the same thing. It's great. It's how it goes sometimes, right? So uh, we are in the middle of the book of Romans. That's what we're, we've been doing for the last, I think we're in the fifth week now of this sermon series, uh, all on Romans 8 that we've been calling God is for you. And uh, as Jack likes to make sure that we all know, Romans 8, such a, a famous chapter in scripture. And who, whose favorite chapter of the Bible was it? Do we remember? Martin Luther, right? This is Martin Luther's favorite chapter in scripture. That's what he said. Um, Martin Luther also is the same guy who said that in a moment of temptation and just being tormented by Satan, that he bent over and he, excuse me, he farted in his face. So maybe we don't take everything Martin Luther said, you know, as I thought that would be funnier. No, is everyone that offended that I just said the word fart that I've said past gas? I was worried. My mom would have been deeply troubled that I just used that word, but she's with Jesus now and she doesn't care. So... But what Martin Luther did say, and this is good, so we'll take this one too. Martin Luther said this about Romans, not just Romans 8, he said Romans, the whole book, it's worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but occupy himself with it every day. As the daily bread of the soul, it can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes, the better it tastes. If you've ever read through the book of Romans, you know that. You know how powerful this book is, how good it is. And so um, as we, we're just going to dive right in tonight into the book of Romans, if that's all right with you. And if, if you've never been here before, uh, again, my name is Lyle. And before I was here at uh, Elements full time, uh, I actually worked for Apple and I was a pretty nerdy guy. All right. I still am a pretty nerdy guy. Uh, I fixed computers for like nine and a half, 10 years, something like that. And uh, I just carry that nerdiness with me, whether I want to or not. So we're going to nerd out a little bit tonight. It's been a while since we've had a five-minute nerd out, but there it is. We're going to five-minute nerd out. I've got the timer going. I don't know how long the five-minute nerd out's going to go tonight. It's going to be five-ish minutes because I didn't practice it, but I want to provide some context for the book of Romans. And I know that that's not fun. That's kind of like, eh, context, sweet. We got to look at background information. That's the fun stuff. That's what we all look forward to, isn't it? Not always, right? So the reality is just five minutes of us nerding out a little bit and kind of digging in and getting this context helps us get so much more understanding out of the text. And so for those of you that this just isn't your favorite thing, I'm sorry, but you can handle five minutes of it. That's the idea, right? So buckle up, five minute nerd out. We're going to start counting now. All right. So what's the context of the book of Romans? It's a letter that was written by the apostle Paul, who uh, we know Paul from a scripture that he had this encounter. He was a Jewish zealot, that he knew the scriptures, he knew the Old Testament, and he was actually commissioned by the Jewish Pharisees and the leaders and the councils to go out and to hunt down Christians. And so he was finding these followers of the way and he was persecuting them. He had letters to put them to death for the blasphemy of the things that they believed and the things that they would preach. And he had this encounter uh, with, with Jesus where Jesus reached out to him and said, why are you persecuting me? And in this moment, Paul goes blind. He's led to a city. Uh, he's supposed to go to this guy's house. This guy prays for him and he gets his sight back. And God reveals his calling on his life that he is to be the one to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and to take it to the Gentiles, to a people who had never received, who, who up until then, 
they didn't quite realize the gospel was for them too. And so he's writing this letter uh, to the Roman church in Rome, obviously, right? Uh, and what we know about Rome is this, is this is huge. Like it is the capital city. It is the center of the empire that's controlling not just lots of Europe, but also into the Middle East and into Israel, into Jerusalem, uh, where the, a lot of the, the Jewish uh, Christians and the people were. And so uh, like most of the letters that were written at the time, uh, they, they write to believers to encourage them to persist through persecution. Now, Rome was a little bit different because of the size of the city. Uh, they also had the Caesar that was there. And so as long as you declare that Caesar is Lord, you're okay. But th- that's the problem with Christians. Who's Lord to a Christian? Jesus, no one else. They would refuse to honor Caesar as Lord. And so as a result of this, uh, Caesars didn't really like the, the Jewish Christians who would say these things. And so uh, Emperor Cl- uh, Claudius was his name uh, at the time that Romans was written. So he banished all of, uh, I'm sorry, he wasn't when it was written. We'll get there. So Claudius, just before Romans was written, he banished all of the, the Jewish people out of Rome. He told them they had to leave. And so they took off. This is probably about 52 AD. If we look at history and look at the, the author Josephus, um, he, he wrote about that. But two years later, Claudius got sick and he died. And so when he died, new Caesar takes over. The new Caesar didn't really have a problem with the Jewish believers. And so they were welcomed back into the Roman church. They got to go back home. That led to some problems though, because you've got these Gentile Christians who've come along and they didn't submit to the regulations. They didn't submit to the ceremonial washings. They didn't do all of the things that a good Jewish believer would have done. And so if you're a Jewish person, you come back and you're kind of seeing the Gentiles are swinging from the chandeliers and you're a little bit worried. And so there's this division that's happening in the church where the church is facing pressure from the outside because they're not declaring Caesar's Lord. They just have to live this quiet life. They have to persist in the faith but now there's a tension in the community. And so Romans is a little bit different than the other epistles. If you notice, most of the letters of scripture, they're written to address believers who are suffering, that they're facing persecution for what they believe and what they're going through. And so these letters are written as an encouragement to the church to continue on, keep doing these things. It's worth it. Jesus is worth it. The things that he will do in your life If you let him do it, it's worth maybe a little bit of suffering because what's going to come in the future, what's already sealed for you in eternity is worth it. It's better. It's better. And so Romans is a book that's full of doctrine. Uh, And maybe that's because uh, it, it was written to a church that was so important. My guess would be that Paul knew Rome being the center of all of of Europe and all of the world at that point in time, um, they had a unique a unique position in the Roman church that that doctrine would be able to spread out and be taken to other churches. And it would be able to be read to multiple communities of believers. And so that's really the context of where we get to when we're reading through the book of Romans as it's a letter addressing those things. How do I do on time? I think we're good. Yeah, did anyone time it? Just under five minutes, I think, if I'm remembering. So we made it tonight. We made it tonight. It's better than the 11 minutes that I went that one week, right, Jack? All right. So now that we have the context, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 30 tonight. And so if you've got uh, your Bible with you, you can uh, turn there, make that passage. If you've got uh, just your phone and you've got the Bible app, we always put the sermon notes in there. Also, if you're streaming online, you should be able to click a link that says sermons. So you can follow along with what we read. You can follow along with what we'll have on the screens um, as well. So Romans chapter 8, let's just read verses 26 to 27 to start. And it says this. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so if you remember last week, if you were with us last week, Jack had a great message, didn't he? That he sets up this moment very early on of what it is to have to wait. And just being stuck in that moment where you feel like you're waiting, that there's this tension of something that's going to happen, that you want to happen, or maybe that you don't want to happen. But there's that tension of having to sit there in that moment. And so this passage is continuing on from that. 
that God knows what it is for us to wait, to have to sit in a moment and not have things be as we want them to be, for good or for worse. And oftentimes, uh, I hear this, this text preached. Uh, did anybody grow up in a charismatic church at all? A couple of you did. Yeah, went to charismatic youth camps. Man, you read this passage at a youth camp, and they always want to make it about speaking in tongues. That there's these moments where we don't know about groanings, uh, or we, we don't know what to pray, and so we've got these groanings, and then the Spirit uh, intercedes for us, and that's when we're supposed to shamana, hamana, hamana, right? Like, yeah, but whatever the... I don't speak in tongues. I don't have that spiritual gift, okay? I'm not knocking it. My wife has it. Some of you have it. But that's not what this passage is referring to. It gets used so frequently to, to try to say this is about speaking in tongues. Paul's not talking about the spiritual gifts here. He does talk about that in 1 Corinthians. So this isn't downplaying the importance of spiritual gifts. But if we're going to interpret this correctly, we've got to know it's a far better interpretation than just encouraging you to have your own personal prayer language with God. Because what this passage is saying, how many of you have been in the waiting? I can wait longer to make sure that all of us raise our hands, but I'm just kidding. We've all known what it is to wait, but even deeper than that, we all know what it is to suffer, don't we? We all know what it is to face hardship, to be in moments where things are not as they ought to be, to see injustices happen around us and to feel like nothing is being done for it. We've all stood in the place of feeling helpless. And I think that that's what that's referring to, is those moments of suffering where the way that Viktor Frankl, he's a a great psychiatrist who went through the Holocaust, the way he said it, is that suffering's like a gas. Gas has this unique property where you put gas inside of a container, and what does it do? It spreads out, and it expands to take up the entirety of its container. And so Viktor Frankl said, suffering is like gas to the soul. Because it doesn't matter. If you put a little bit of suffering into your soul, what does it do? It expands and it takes up the entire thing. So if you're going through a little bit, it doesn't matter. That little bit has a way of becoming a lot more than that, doesn't it? We've all been there. We've all experienced those moments. And maybe you've experienced moments where you're on the extreme end of that. And we're talking like you're ugly crying, you know, like the sobbing, and you can't even get words out because you're crying so hard. That's what this is saying. There are those moments that there are groanings that we're making because we can't even talk. We can't even make sense. And in those moments that we don't know what to pray or that we wish we could pray, but we can't even get it out. The Holy Spirit's there to intercede for us and pray in that moment. Think about that. God, through his Holy Spirit, is always praying for you on your behalf. And not just like the prayers that that you hear pastors pray, or maybe even like your own prayer, where you're like, I'm not really that good of a prayer, and I don't know how to do that, and my prayer is usually just like, God, bless them, amen. Like, know what to do. The Holy Spirit knows in that moment what you need to pray, and the Holy Spirit is praying that according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit already knows what you need. God already knows what you need, and he is interceding on your behalf in those moments that you can't find the words, that you can't even get it out. He's getting it out for you, and so that's the great hope that we see here is that, yes, waiting is hard. We heard that last week. Suffering is even worse. The Christian church in these early days knew what it was to suffer. And Paul's writing to encourage them that when that suffering takes hold in your soul, it's okay. The Holy Spirit is there with you. God's not just with you in the waiting. God's not just with you in the suffering. God is already at work in the suffering. We need to see that. God is already at work in that moment. So even though it feels like maybe he's not doing anything or he's not doing what we want him to do, on your behalf, he's already praying for you and he's praying according to his will. That's beautiful. We need that. And if you think about those moments when uh, we get overwhelmed, if you know anything about your brain and your brain chemistry, it's a part of your brain that's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is something that when you get triggered, it, it gets this response where the adrenaline starts pumping. And so we know this, the, the fight, 
flight or freeze, right? Are you familiar with that? That whenever a person's faced with a threat or, or something that makes them anxious, we typically have this response. And so I know it's frustrating because there's those moments that we get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do. And so we just freeze. We're frozen. Maybe we're kind of paralyzed by our anxiousness or by our fears. God's amygdala does not get hijacked. God doesn't freeze in the moments that you're frozen. God is already at work and has already stepped in, is already interceding on behalf of you through his Holy Spirit. Some of you need to receive that tonight and to know that God is not distant. He's not forgotten about you. He's not given up on you. Far from it. He's stepped into the gap for you and he's praying for you right now in this moment according to his will, what he knows that you need. We serve a good God. And so even though we're in the midst of suffering, even though we're in the midst of pain and circumstances that maybe don't make sense, God is still intervening and still working there. And so Tom Wright, he said this in his uh, commentary, Romans for Everyone. He said, the church is not to be apart from the pain of the world. As much as we wish that we could, we want to do it, right? Like how many of you are like, I get to suffer today, hooray. That's just not something that we pray. The church is not to be apart from the pain of the world, Tom says. He says, now we discover that God himself does not stand apart from the pain, both of the world and of the church, but comes to dwell in the middle of it, in the person and the power of the spirit. That's a great hope for us. He continues on to say that when we are thus marked out as God's people, not just outwardly, but in the secret prayers and the loves of our innermost being, we can be completely sure that God is in charge that he can bring good out of whatever happens. And so that moves us into verse 28. And that's what, a famous verse. Might need to memorize this one as Martin Luther would challenge us to memorize the entire book. Romans 8, 28 is a great place to start. And it says this, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things, what's that excluding? All things, gets everything. Doesn't matter what it is. All things work together for good. For whom? for those who are called according to his purpose. There's several things that I want us to see here. There's two qualifiers that tell us who this promise is for, right? One of these is on you, and that's the first part, for those who love God, okay? So if you confess your love for God, if you just say you love God, and then on the other end of that, God himself calls out these people. He says, you're marked according uh, to, to my purposes, you, he's calling us out to fulfill something. That's what it says. And so for those of you who've received the call of God on your life, for those of you who love God, we know this, all things work together for good. And so if you're in Christ, this promise is for you. But notice how that verse starts, and we know. I think that's important, and we know. Not we think, not that we hope, no, we know. We know what, that all things will work together for good. Another one of the early church fathers, the brother of Jesus, his name is James, and he wrote a book as well. He wrote a letter to the church. Jack quoted it last week, and I was like, dude, not only did he steal what I was wearing tonight, he stole my verse last week too. So James, chapter one, he writes to the church and he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Notice the words, for you know, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so why is it important that we know this? Why do they both take care to use some particular language here about having confidence in the things that we know? And it's because God works through our suffering. He works through our heartache and our hurt in order that we may be complete followers is what that's saying in James. That's the purpose that God has. If he's called you according to his purpose, what's his purpose as we go through suffering? His purpose is this. It's that you would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, how many of you remember back to when we talked through, uh, what was it, the, the Sermon on the Mount? We use this word, being a teleos follower of Jesus. Does anyone remember that, teleos? Talks quite a bit. Good. I see some nods. Sweet. I'm proud of you all. All right. So, teleos is this Greek word uh, that that really it comes from the the root telos. And so, if something has a purpose, that's that's its telos. So the eye has a telos. And it's to what? 
to see, right? A hand has a telos. It's so that we can grab things. It's why God gave us opposable thumbs. Now we have dominion over the animals. So there's, there's a purpose to things. And so being this, this idea of telos is about fulfilling purpose. That when human beings were created, God designed you for a purpose. And in the ancient Near East, at the time that this was written, to fulfill your purpose would be for you to achieve your highest end. The greatest thing that you could do in your life would be to realize your purpose and then to fulfill it. And so this idea of being a teleos, follower of Jesus, means that we're single-minded, fully devoted in, the, in a singular direction in pursuing what our purpose is and in fulfilling that purpose once it's made known to us. And so that's God's purpose for you. That's his heart for you is to know why he created you, to know why you're going through what you're going through. And he tells us what that is here. And it's so simple. It really is. And yet we like to complicate it because if, if we're being honest, we don't like the answer. We don't like what God's saying to us here. Because what's God's purpose for us in all of this? He says it. He says his purpose is that you would be a wholehearted follower of Christ. And we're going to see that in the coming verses, that the reason God works all things together for good, the reason that he does these things is to form you into the image of his son, Jesus, so that we could be more like Jesus. That's his purpose. And yet so often that trips us up because that's not enough. Let's be honest. It's not enough, is it? How many of you just, you're like, man, I wish I knew what my future was. I need a job and I can't find work right now that pays me what I need to make. And so I'm struggling to pay my rent and inflation's killing us. Gas prices are killing us. God, what do you have for me in the future? Or some of you are just wondering, is God gonna fix my marriage? That I've got a brokenness in my relationship with others. And I'm not able to give what they need and they're not giving me what I need and I'm struggling to understand how to make sense of this situation because I know God loves marriage and I love my partner. I wanna be there for them, but I'm struggling to do this and they're struggling too. Where are you, God? What's your purpose in that? Some of you might have broken relationships with your children and you're wondering if years of hurt and built up bitterness are keeping you from the things of God and keeping you from fulfilling the calling that maybe you feel he gave you decades ago. And so I'm here to minimize any of those things. Those things hurt. Those things are real issues that we all face. And we would love for God to step into that and to give us perfect clarity, wouldn't we? And yet those things aren't for us. Here's what's for you. Here's what's for you to know in all of those situations that everything God purposes to happen in your life is to allow you to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He's good. Jesus walked a perfect life. He loved people well. He stepped into brokenness. He stepped into darkness and he brought light. He brought healing. He brought wholeness. He brought health, he brought blessing for people. And we wanna walk in those ways with a winsomeness, with a gentleness that Jesus did, with a kindness that Jesus did. We wanna be a church like that, don't we? And so I don't minimize what you're going through. I don't wanna minimize any suffering, but I want you to know that even in the midst of your heartache and your hurt and your own brokenness, Jesus is with you. He's praying for you right now through his spirit. And his ultimate purpose in all of that is to help shape you to be more like him. When we receive that, and when we begin to just live like that's true, looking for how we can come alongside that purpose in our life, that's when we suddenly get clarity. I wish it was in a different order. I really do. In fact, I'll be honest. There's times that there are things that I've gone through in my past and maybe some of you have gone through that you still haven't received the clarity that you wish you could get. And you may never get it this side of heaven, but I promise you, when you pursue your purpose to be more like Christ and to let whatever happens, whatever things take place in your life, to let it form you into the image of Jesus, that's when healing starts to happen. That's when we start to have a a purpose for what we're going through. Because what I know is this, that when we know something, 
Enduring is so much easier, isn't it? Enduring hardship suddenly becomes something that is a little bit more manageable. That's Viktor Frankl, as he talked about suffering, he also said this, that he who has a why to live for can overcome almost any how. And so if you know your purpose, if you've got that why, in your heart and in your mind. It doesn't matter your circumstance. It doesn't matter how God chooses to work those things out or how you get out of the situation. It doesn't matter how that situation is happening. You can overcome it through Christ. And we know, we know these things to be true. We need to let these things not just uh, become something we're intellectually convinced of. We need to know the truth of Romans 8, 28 in our hearts. And we need to live it out so that we can demonstrate to a watching world that we know God is for us. Because here's this, this hope is not just for you. It's for everyone that's around you as well. If you're in Christ, the hope that we have that God works all things together for good is not just a promise for you to see and live out God intended for that to be something others get to witness through you, through your faithfulness and through your devotion to your Lord and to your Savior, to remain in Him and to let His purposes work themselves out in your lives. Moving on into verse 28, uh, 29, Paul said, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so there's a chain of verbs here. There's a chain of things uh, that are taking place. And just with the time that we have left, I want to make sure that we understand what's going on here. Um, It's real easy to kind of stumble over this stuff. And so here's my preface. This isn't about... um, this isn't the debate between Calvinists and Arminius, okay? Like, I, I don't want to go there. We're not taking it there. In fact, Jack gave me this uh, text, and I was like, oh, sweet. I get to be the one, the guy who's reformed and everybody wants to beat up because I, I lean a little Calvinist on most days. Um, you know, we get there. So fine, all right? Like, don't at me. We don't need to have the conversation tonight. It's not going to be beneficial for building any of us up. But uh, this can be hijacked as well because we start chasing doctrine that's not primary doctrine. That's not like the essential stuff that we need to know. And so I wanna make sure that we have an essential understanding of what's really being said here, because again, this is beautiful. So we'll start with this idea of God's foreknowledge. Well, before we even get to that, look at at all of those verbs. I wanna point something out. For those he foreknew, he also, what, predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. What tense is all of that in? Man, and they say education is failing in America. I heard it from the majority of you. It's in past tense. It's done. It's already done. All of that is finished in the work of Jesus Christ. All of it. If you're in Christ, this is for you. Not just for you to know, this is for you to live in because it is a present reality. It is something already accomplished and already done. So what do these words mean? For those whom he foreknew. So there's a specific group of people that that Paul continues to refer to here. And again, it's the Christian. It's the person who's in Christ, the person who confesses Jesus as Lord. And it's the person that God has called according to his purposes. And so if that's you, I want you to know this, that God knew you before time. And I'm not just saying this idea of knowing. It's, It's not that God knew about you. Okay? It would be easy for us to look at that God foreknew you. No, God didn't just know about you in advance. God knew you. Okay? There's a biblical way of using this word no that implies intimacy, a deep intimacy, that there's a relational knowing that when you're around a person enough, you understand them, you know them intimately. And so that's why Paul's reminder here 
uh, it's to the suffering believer, is what you should know uh, now is that, that God knows you. God knows who you are. God knows all about you. Uh, God has all this information, but it's a deep relational information that even before time, he knew how you were wired. He knew your personality. And the way I like to think of it is this. Think of an author. Let's get uh, someone like J.K. Rowling, right? She wrote Harry, well, no, we're Christians, so we can't talk about Harry Potter. So uh, Tom Clancy and Jack Ryan, right? Nobody goes there. That's a much more moral decision, right? To talk about, uh, we'll stop there. All right. Think of J.R.R. Tolkien and Bilbo Baggins. Tolkien knows Bilbo. He knows the hobbits. He knows Aragorn. He knows Legolas. He knows Gandalf. Why? Because Tolkien created these characters. And so as he's writing the story of these characters out, he knows who they are, he knows how they think, he knows their personalities, and some of that gets developed as he's writing it all out, but as as it happens, he's thought of these things in advance to know who he's writing about and to know what they're gonna be like. And if we think about it, all of their personalities and just the different ways that that's reflected, it's all ultimately a, a bit of a reflection of Tolkien himself, isn't it? And so in the same way, God is the author of all things, is the creator of the universe. Genesis tells us he made you in his image. And so we are image bearers in Christ, that we are reflections of God. And God knows us. He knows how we're wired. He knows our patterns. He knows all of those things about us. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves you. And so it's not just that he knew you in advance, he, he foreknew you, and because of that, he also predestined you. And so here's the word that trips people up, but think about it, like predestined. How many of you, you've heard of destiny, right? What's destiny about? It's, ultimate, it's your ultimate destination. That's where that comes from. If you're trying to go somewhere, what's your destination? So God predetermined the destination of your life, and what was that destination? that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the most important thing for you. That's why it goes back to that. I know that sometimes that doesn't feel like enough, but let me tell you, when you receive it and embrace that it is, it's amazing how much the rest of it falls into place. And so if you know that in advance, everything that God is going to bring into your life and everything that God is going to allow to happen to you, it's to more deeply form the image of Christ for others to observe in you, to help bring them to faith in him. And so Paul's really piecing together his final argument here as to what God's going to do with our suffering, with our hurt. That's really what Romans chapter five through eight is all about. If you wanna go back and read those five through eight, just it sets up uh, this, this picture that, that as Christians, there's these sufferings that we go through. And yet it leads us to this, that God allows you to go through hardship. God then steps into that hardship so that he can work it together for your good to enable you to be more like Jesus, all to the glory of Jesus. And how do we know that God will do this? We know because we can look at the cross and see how it's already happened. We see Jesus' most glorious moment when he triumphs over death. And likewise, God will turn around our situation in the long run, ultimately, in order to make us like Christ. And it will bring, get this, even more glory to Jesus. Somehow it all works out. And so as a follower of Christ, in the midst of whatever trials we go through, this should give us great hope to know that God, in the grand scheme of things, is ultimately in control of it all. And so uh, the life of a Christian, it's meant to be a reflection of Jesus' life in the same way that Christ received, uh, or sorry, he suffered before he received his ultimate glory. We too will suffer. I hate to break it to you. It's going to happen. You're going to suffer some more. We all have already gone through it at some point in our lives. More's coming. And yet, when we receive that God wants to do something through that, to lead us to a future glory where we get to step from this life into eternity with Christ, that's when it's gonna make sense. That's your final destination. That's what God predestined for your life. That's why he continues. Those whom he predestined, he also called. So this idea of calling, it's not just that he's like, hey buddy, what's going on? You know, not called like that. It's not called uh, in the sense where he's like giving you this great thing. Like, no, he already predestined. He already talked about purpose. The idea of called is just that he summoned you toward himself. God said, hey, come here. 
because he's good and because he knows who he is and he knows that we need him. And so this, this calling, God summons you toward him and you were dead in your sins. There was no way that you could do any of this on your own. Paul spends plenty of time in Romans 1 through 3 talking about the fact that we are dead in our sins, in our trespasses, and yet God speaks into the darkness that is our brokenness, and he calls us out by name, and he calls us from death, and he brings us to life. It's good. It's good. He didn't stop there, though, because after he called you into relationship with himself, God then made you right with him. That's what it means that you are justified. I know it's kind of like justified. There's kind of different ways that that can be used. Um, But ultimately it's this. If you stand in a court of law, if you've been accused of something and you are justified in the court of law, what that means is you are determined to be in the right. You have right standing with the law and with the judge, with the system that's in place. And so through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, God calls you from death into life. And when he did that, he He put you into right relationship with him through everything that Jesus accomplished for you. And that justification that we receive from him, all of this leads us to the future glorification that will be ours, that will take place in our lives when they come to an end. I don't know if you've been tracking, but this, this is the gospel. That's the good news of Christ right there. That's the gospel of Jesus that this entire process from God's foreknowledge of knowing you in advance to the glorification that will happen when all of us one day get to go and, and reign with him on high. All of that is good news for those who confess Jesus as Lord because Jesus is the one who accomplished all of that. And so that's what we need to know, that when we're glorified, we get new heavenly bodies, these glorified bodies. Jesus was like walking through walls and stuff, you know, and like just disappearing. So I really hope that that's part of our spiritual bodies. That's gonna be fun, right? Like we're just like, hey buddy, and we beam in and out of places. Seems fun. I'm up for that. But not only that, we get to reign with Christ in eternity. We get to partake not just uh, in, in little glimpses of his glory, but the fullness of his glory will be ours forever. And we will know it completely. We will know it thoroughly. We will never be separated from it. And that is a great hope that all of the suffering and all the things that you have to endure now will ultimately be worth it because you will look more like Jesus, you will know the heart of Jesus, and because you will be conformed to his image, God has a glorious future that awaits you where you can fully enjoy his presence. I know Jack and I hope it means a lot of golf, maybe some holes in one, you know? It'd be great. I don't know what that's gonna look like. I don't know what heaven exactly is gonna be. I just know that it's gonna be amazing. And I just know that that's something that we all as believers need to look forward to, is this future glory that he has for us. John 17, 22, as Jesus is praying for all believers in that passage, he actually says that he's given us his glory. There's a glory that awaits you in the days to come that we will receive, lock it in, it's gonna happen. It's actually already yours in Christ. As Jack kind of mentioned, the already not yet last week, that these things already are true. They are positional realities that we get to to live in and and it, it, it not yet has been fulfilled, but we know it will be. Why? Because we know that God is faithful. And so how do we obtain this? Simple, we stay the course, that's it. We stay the course. Remain obedient to the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. And when that feels daunting, there's moments, right, that feels difficult to to persist in in what we know is is hardship and difficult. And yet, uh, when it is daunting, those are the moments that we preach this passage to ourselves. Because the good news is this, when it's overwhelming, the Holy Spirit has already stepped in to pray for you, to pray God's will over your life, And so even though we're fully uh, weak in that moment, even though we can't seem to overcome our sin or, or our suffering seems unbearable and the hurt is too great where all of our strength is gone, the Holy Spirit's praying God's perfect will over us so that we can endure to the end. So do you see how this builds on itself? Do you see how this works, that this all fits together? You can't do this on your own. And yet the, the wonderful hope of the gospel is is that you never were intended to do it all on your own. Jesus already did it for you. 
He already accomplished the work that we could never accomplish. And so that's why Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. That's it. We rest on the saving work of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And so what do we do? We simply love God and we remain obedient to following after Jesus, knowing that that ultimately is our calling. That's our future. Let's pray. Jesus, um, that's my heart for us tonight. Just that we would see the good news here of how you've worked all things together for good in our past. I know that uh, there are people in this room who are, even now they're in the midst of hurt and heartache. I know there's a family here who's grieving the loss of a son who took his own life recently. There's another family that's grieving uh, another son who uh, was murdered. I know in my own life that at the beginning of this year and just really about midway from last year on that uh, just watching my mom have a broken neck and just slowly watching the life drain from her until pneumonia took her, her life. We all deal with death. We all deal with hardship. We all deal with circumstances and moments that just don't make sense. Or we just don't have the words to even pray any longer because we're just too weak and we're too tired. Would you show us tonight how you are with us? Would you remind us afresh, maybe for those who aren't going through anything now, would you remind us of ways in the past that you showed us your faithfulness, that you were with us, that you worked in us and through us to redeem our situation? Would you help us to find purpose just knowing the great calling that you've put on our life, our lives, not to to go to this school, not to get this job, not to pursue uh, this amount of wealth, but the purpose you've placed before every person who confesses faith in you is to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. We need all the help in the world for that to happen. That's not our heart's natural inclination. And yet your spirit intercedes for us, even now in this moment, praying that that would be true, praying for us in ways that we don't even know how to pray for ourselves, that we could see this worked out. And so God, just remind us again of your goodness, of your faithfulness, that you work all things together for our good, that we can take this to the bank, that, that you knew us before time. You gave us this great glorious hope for a future. You called us out of the darkness. You made us right with you so that we could receive your glory ultimately. So just in this moment, speak to us. Holy Spirit, bring conviction about into our lives. Take a moment to pray for yourself. Ask God to show you what, what do you need to take from tonight? Maybe it's a lyric in a song. Maybe it's something from, from this passage. Maybe it was one of those principles that, that we saw here. But what needs to just really plant itself in your heart this week that you need to ponder over and think about? God, where are you calling us to change, to not just sit here in conviction, but where you want us to, to make changes so that we can see your grace begin to take effect in our lives? So Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you give us illumination of what you want us to receive from your word tonight? Thanks that we get to gather together to do this, that we have the freedom to enjoy it. Thanks for this community of believers who gets to pray for each other, that in the midst of hurt and heartache and suffering, that we don't go through it alone. Not only are you with us, God, but you've surrounded us with a community of people who not just pray for each other, but who are there for each other, who show up for each other. Help us to get better at that as a church. We always want to excel at coming alongside uh, hurting people so that we can be your hands and feet. So Jesus, you're here, you're moving. Would you continue your work? in us and through us 
as we wrap up tonight, as we go about our week. We love you, Lord. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's a good word, good reminder of the past tense miracles of God. Bring the present reality of his activity and secure a future promise that we get to live into. And uh, you may be here tonight, and uh, maybe you're going through some of the heartache that uh, Lyle kind of touched on. And if that's you, I'd love to pray for you tonight. We've, um, maybe Ryan can join me down here if, if uh, so at dismissal. Again, if you're new, we'd love to meet you at the 10 minute party. Um, and uh, we invite you to that. Uh, Karen will be there and a few others. Um, you can meet Lyle there. Um, and, and then reminder for the church potluck, that means food. Um, and so if you could be here next week, if you're not able to be here, that's fine. Uh, there's actually a drop down menu where you can actually give online uh, and maybe you'll bid on a virtual dessert and it's less calories. We aim to please here. Um, and I think, are we doing the pie in the face thing again? All right, you might be able to pie Lyle and I in the face. Uh, we'll bid on that. So just to invite you back to that. Uh, dinner tonight, Black Bear Diner is where we're heading. So there's a group of people that go out to dinner every Sunday night. And so in about 25 minutes, uh, Black Bear Diner where, is where that team will be. So would you stand with me? I just want to read this verse over us and we'll be dismissed. Again, if you want prayer, uh, Ryan and I will be down here. We'd love to pray for you. Um, and we know... We don't think, we don't hope, we know that for those who love God, all things will work together for good. Doesn't mean everything that happened is good, but God will work all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. As a follower of Jesus, that's you. If you're circling around investigating Jesus and you need him, we'd love to pray for you, encourage you. May his goodness rest upon you this week. Go with you in every second, in every minute, in every moment. And we'll join back together to worship and to feed our faces next week. So love you all.